Open your Bibles tonight to Titus, the second chapter. I did a lot of reading over the second chapter, read a lot of commentaries, and I came to the conclusion that Paul is writing to Titus, and he's giving some really good advice with purpose. And so as we get to the purpose, I, I want us to have the correct mindset. In the commentaries that I read this week, I tried to find the idea of evangelism, mass evangelism, and where we come up with the concept, and does it really work? I looked into the idea of crusades, and the closest thing I could find to a crusade in the scriptures was Peter, when he preached on the day of Pentecost and the thousands were saved, but that's not a crusade. I I thought about uh, the mass media that we use today, and, and, you know, that just wasn't in being in the times of the scriptures, so it's not found in the scriptures. I thought about uh, doing such things as concerts and events to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tried to find that in the scriptures, and I could not find that in the scriptures as well. I thought about different types of rallies that we have. and You know, as you dig into the scriptures, you don't find any basis for these things in the scriptures. Now, it's not wrong to try different things to reach people, but the scriptures just don't have it in there. But what Titus is being told to do when he's told to select people, to pastor the churches, to have leadership, and when he's told to to teach the the people, and chapter 2 is about teaching those, and we've talked about uh, what he had to say. He's to teach the older uh, men, to teach the younger men. He's to teach the older women, that they are to teach the younger women. Uh, We understand from the scriptures and And from the historical accounts that that the younger women were probably just considered to be people under the age of 60 years of age as they were raising children and grandchildren. And so they had to present themselves properly. And so Paul tells Titus some things to teach the younger women. Last week we talked about also he was to teach the younger men. There were certain things that he had to teach the younger men how to act, how to speak, and those type of things. And so tonight, we come to probably our favorite part. We're going to talk to people about how to conduct themselves in the workplace. Everybody likes to work, right? Everybody likes to have a job. Everybody likes their occupation. Everybody likes their bosses. Everyone loves the people they work with. And so it's going to be a really good topic for us tonight. I started off with evangelism. Because biblical evangelism is personal relationships. And he says the older people are to live it. The younger people are to live it. And what we're going to see tonight as we get into the scriptures is when you go to the workplace, you are to be someone that does not hinder the gospel but promotes the gospel. When you go to work and your boss looks at you and the fellows that you work with, those people that are around you, the customers that come in, whatever the business might be, they are to know that you are a child of God. And mass evangelism will take place only when Christians can show the world what Christ really looks like. I was thinking about the number of baptisms and how they've gone down over the years. We're not reaching people for Christ like we were supposed to. And so the numbers drop, and I wondered why it dropped. There's a correlation with the way we live. We look at society and the things in society normally coming to the church before long. Whatever happens in society, we'll try it. We'll put a Christian spin on it, and we'll try to get people to come into the church. But as we act more like the world, less people are coming to know Christ. So we come to this 
section of scripture, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. And Paul writes to Titus and he says, Exhort, exhort servants, servants to be obedient to the own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adore, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Well, you say he's talking about slaves, right? Exhort the servants. We're not servants. We're not slaves. But in a sense, we are. As we go to work, we have a master at the workplace. And we are to give him the honor that is due him. So let's look a little bit about the slaves. And understand that there were slaves in that society. And they were in every place, including the home. Most families, if had any kind of resources at all, we're going to have some sort of servants there. Most of the times the families would consist of everybody that was still living. The patriarch, the matriarch, or the grandparents would be living in the home with the parents, with the children. They were all there. Great-grandchildren, whatever it was, would be in the home. And there was always some type of servants as Paul is dealing with that issue. So let's look at two or three passages of scriptures. Go with me first, and we'll go in order to Colossians, if you will. Mark your place here. And go to Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22. Paul writes to the church and he says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. That's the attitude we are to take into the workplace. And you need to remember it is essential to have that kind of attitude when you go to the workplace because the people you're working with need the Lord. They need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And you may be the only person they hear and see the gospel from. You may be it. And I want you to know that I believe that there are a lot of people that claim to be Christians that are on the church rolls that go to work and work around people and they don't live a Christian life. And it's hard to win people to Christ when Christ says, I've come to save you from your sins, and you're still rolling around in them. And so he's, we have to understand, and Paul says, here it is in Colossians. Here's the church. Church, this is how you need to live. This is how you need to act in the workplace so that you can reach people for our king. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Galatians Ephesians and Philippians. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 5 and 6. Here's Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Verse 5 he says, Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. He says, listen, you need to be in fear and trembling when you're working for someone. When, you're, when they were slaves and the master told them to do something, they need to be obedient. Not because they were a piece of property and might get killed, but because what Paul is saying here is we're doing it for Christ. We want people to know Christ. We want people to come to Christ. So do it not with our service, verse 6, as man-pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God. And notice what he says. From the heart. I mean, we go to work, right? Well, you, preacher, you work with Christians all the time. You don't understand. You don't go to the workplace, and you don't work in the, in, in the secular field. But you know, you all all know that I wasn't always a preacher, right? That, that I took my first full-time church when I was 40 years old. That I worked in construction, that I built, uh, helped build the federal prisons in Yazoo City. 
I was quality control manager. I, I, I worked for the state highway department. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to reach people you work with. It, it's, you know, I was over 1,200 people. And sometimes, I don't care how good they are, Sometimes they'll try your patience, won't they? I mean, they, they'll mess up stuff. and You know, we're building a $110 million prison, and they go out there and cost us $180,000, $190,000, and you're responsible for it. What do you say to them? Well, we love you in Christ. So that's what we're supposed to say to them. Well, what do we say to them? Sometimes we lose control of our thoughts, and sometimes things come out of our mouth that shouldn't, and then we want to tell them before we leave work, we love you, we want you to come to church with us, we want to share Jesus Christ with you after we've talked over it to them. Life is real. Life is short. Christ is real. And eternal life is forever. Which is worth the most. So he says, don't do it as I service. Do it, as, do it unto Christ and put your heart into it. Put your heart into it. Work your way back toward Titus, but stop at 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the first couple of verses, we want to see what he has to tell Timothy. Let as many servants as are under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may, be, may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved, teach and exhort these things. Have respect. Have respect. So, in a sense, we become slaves when we go to the workplace. And our bosses are to be our masters, and we are to be obedient. And we are to do what they ask us to do. Paul writing to Titus, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he gives us some things that we are to do. And I call these character qualities for the employee. Character qualities for the employee. Notice the first one in verse 9. Servants, exhort servants. Titus, exhort them to be obedient to their own masters. Don't we like that word obedient? Isn't it a fun word in our English language? Don't we like to be obedient people? You know, every time I hear that word obedient, I think about, I used to have a black lab. And I used to duck hunt a lot when I was much younger. Much, much younger. And that dog, he was a good dog. But sometimes in the duck blind, when those ducks are coming over, he just couldn't hardly sit still. He would go to trembling. And he'd be looking up, and if you, if, he, just, he, he would just let out a squeal at the wrong time sometimes. And so I sent him to Andy May's School of Obedience. And that, that dog would be sitting in there, and it would be cold. It'd be If you've ever duck hunted in the Delta, I, I'm from Yazoo County, you know, and if you ever duck hunted over there, and you're in those blinds and in that shallow water, I hunted in rice fields, and that dog would sit there, and I could see him start to shake. And he would, I could see him start to look up. And when he did, I hit him in the head with my gun barrel. Now, I didn't kill the dog, okay? But about three or four times like that, and you know what he got to where he would do? He'd sit still. He went to obedience school. And that's what we need to do. We need to go to obedience school. And if you're having trouble being obedient in the workplace, you come to my office. I still have that shotgun barrel. 
and I can pop you upside the head a couple times and you'll get the picture, right? Well, certainly not. Because it has to be from what? The heart. We want, we're not eye service, but service from the heart. So why are we obedient or why are the first quality is submissive? We're to have a submissive attitude in the workplace. When the person, the foreman, the supervisor, the boss comes in and tells you to do something, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to do it, right? If you went to the doctor, if you were in the hospital, and the doctor came in and told the nurse, to give you a shot of morphine or something to calm you down before you went into surgery, and she decided not to do it, how would you feel about it? Well, I can tell you I'd feel about it, especially if they came at me with a needle. We want people to do what they're supposed to do. Shouldn't we be the same way? Shouldn't we be the same type of people because the world is watching us. It's not about being obedient just to be obedient. It's about doing what God has commanded us to do and submitting ourselves to the Lord and doing things as God would have us to do them. Be obedient. Have that submissive attitude. That word, when you look at verse 9, to be obedient, it means to have a sincerity of heart. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, well, we might as well look at it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. I got it marked. Servants, be submissive to your masters. That's the same word. It says, servants, have a sincerity of heart to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Peter says, here it is. It's easy to love people that love you, right? I mean, that's easy. It's easy for me to love my wife because she loves me. It's easy for me to love my children because they love me. Uh, I, I think you love me. Right, Laura? You love me? Okay. And, and But I have to have that same type of love for the people that are hard to love. Because it's not about them, it's about my relationship with God. And God loves everybody. I mean, he died on the cross for everybody. For God so loved the whole wide world that he died for us. That's the type of love we need to have. That's the type of submission we need to have in the workplace. Because there are people there, maybe your boss that needs to be saved, that needs to have Christ in their life. Point number two, or quality number two, is you need to be an excellent worker. Uh, servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things. To be well-pleasing. Well-pleasing to God. You can go back to Ephesians 6, 5, Colossians, and you'll see it in there. I read a commentary, and it was more of a magazine than a commentary. And they, the reporter or the guy writing the article asked a, a, a pastor of a pretty good-sized church in the United States, well, a big church, he says, when you write your sermon, who do you write it for? And he gave the correct answer. And I wish I could tell you it was my answer, and it is. And what he said, I write my sermons as an offering to God. He says, the work I do to prepare my sermons, I do it as an offering to God. And so when you're in the workplace, the things that you're doing, you're doing as an offering to God. You want God to have it. You, you want God to get the glory and the credit for whatever you're doing because you're doing it for all for His glory and His honor. He needs to have the credit with it, right? So you're giving him an offering of your work. So what kind of offering are you giving? Is it a good offering? Is it something he would be pleased enough? Is it, is it something that he would, he would, when you get to heaven, he's going to hold up before you and say, and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. This is a great offering that you gave me. 
You worked hard. You showed people what it meant to be a Christian worker. And people came to Christ because of your attitude in the workplace. There's another one. And, and this is the one where sometimes we have trouble. At the end of verse 9 it says, To be well pleasing in all things, not answering back. Y'all ever answer back? Y'all know what that means, right? There's a song. I remember it when I was a kid. Some of y'all remember it. It goes something like, yak yak don't talk. Y'all remember that song? Now, if you remember that song, you're kind of old, right? Who wrote that song? Who, who sung that song? Anybody remember? Who? Ben? Could have been. But it makes the point, right? We are to be peaceable. Do you, do you ever... Now, that talking back, we, we're going to look at it from a couple of different viewpoints. Boss comes in and he says, I need you to go down two doors down and get a box of, that's on the desk and bring it in here. And you say, I'll be glad to do it. Or you say... Why me? I'm here working. Why not somebody else? You've just broken all the rules. Right? Be submissive. Be excellent in your work. And don't talk back. But we've all done it, right? There's sometimes we don't understand why they want us to do this and not somebody else. I've often wondered, this, when you think about that, we don't ever think about, well, why did Christ have to do it? Why couldn't somebody else down the cross for us? It's the same type of thing, right? He had something to do. The Father told him he, this is what he needed to do. He said, what? Well, not my will, but thine. I'll go do it. And he died on the cross that we might have everlasting life. We go into the workplace. We understand we have a boss. Our boss comes in. Our supervisor comes in. He tells us something to do, or she tells us something to do. And we say, why me. Why not somebody else? And the peace is broken, right? Don't talk back. I wrote two things in my notes. One, there's a command chain. There's a command chain. We actually had a water cooler in my office, which were portable trailers as we build in the prisons. And you go to that water cooler and you could hear every gripe and complaint people had. Do you believe that? I watched, uh, and it was a terrible show, but I watched it because I, I love history. It was called Saving Private Ryan. Anybody ever watch that besides me? Man, it was, had some terrible language in it. But my great uncle was in the 101st Airborne and he jumped into Normandy and I just kind of watched it. But they were walking across the field and Tom Hanks was listening and the soldiers were in the back and they were griping and they asked him and, and he said, and one of the guys said, well, you don't ever say anything. And he said, the gripes go up. We pass them up. Not around and not down. If you have a complaint... You take it to the boss, right? You take it to the supervisor. You take it to the person ahead of you and you go through what we call the chain of command. You take it to the water cooler and the other thing I wrote in my notes is open rebellion. You get out of the chain of command and you begin to stir up trouble at the water cooler, you're beginning to start an open rebellion against God. The work. God has given us, given us instructions for the workplace. Go to verse 10 now. In verse 10, he says, not pilfering. Y'all like that word? Y'all know what it means? What? Stealing. Surely no one would steal from the workplace. Right? We, we wouldn't tolerate people stealing from the workplace. 
The next point is you need a Christian character to be honest. So we're not going to steal. We're not going to embezzle. And that's where the word embezzling comes from. It's from that Greek word. And so we're not going to do that because God doesn't want us to do that. How do we know he doesn't want us to steal? Because we've all read Exodus chapter 20, right? And in Exodus chapter 20, it says, Thou shalt not steal. Well, what is stealing? I I mean, preacher, what are you talking about stealing? Well, the paper clips. We're taking the paper clips on. We're stealing the products. And you know, when you talk about slaves, most of the businesses in Paul's day were home businesses. Remember, he worked as a tent maker. He worked in someone's home making tents. So everything's in the family. It's family oriented. So they're stealing from the family. It's wrong to steal, regardless of paper clip, money, time. Time. When you're not doing the job that you're called to do, are you stealing? When you're not working. Now I know you can't work 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. In our society they give you breaks. And and I get so aggravated. You know, building a federal prison you have federal guidelines. And the folks on the crews that smoked. You know what they got? You know what they got? Extra breaks, right? Don't steal. Don't steal products, don't steal things of value, and don't steal the time that your employer is paying you. Does it make a difference? You've got to win those people for Christ. They're in your workplace, and you're in that workplace so that you can be a witness for Jesus Christ, and you can make a difference in their life, and you cannot do it if you're dishonest. They can get that from the world. We need to give them something different. We are to be different. And there's one more. Notice what it says in verse 10. That they may put on. I like the word put on. The doctrine of God our Savior. In all things. All things. Be loyal. Notice whose doctrine it is. The doctrine of God our Savior. So a characteristic of a good Christian worker is they are loyal to Christ. That you're living a life, that you're working as an example so that people when they look at you, know that you belong to Christ and you are loyal to Christ. How many Christians do you think are actually loyal to Christ? Monday through Friday. It's not hard to be loyal to Christ when you come in these doors and come in and you sit down and and we sing song. Carrie does a wonderful job leading our congregational hymns and we have someone get up and sing special music and the music's always just really good here and, and, and... We sing the hymns together, and we have prayer, and we have the children's story, and the preacher gets up, and he hollers at us for a while, and and we have some more prayer, and we have a hymn of invitation, and, and it's easy to live for Christ at that point. We're loyal. We walk out those doors, and down those steps, and out these doors, and the next morning, we're in the workplace. And the loyalty we had in these pews, needs to go into the door of wherever you work. Whether you work inside, whether you work outside with your hands, you need to show loyalty to Christ. And I'm afraid most Christians tend to forget that. You don't find workers like Paul's talk about in our society today. They're unique. They're hard to come by. But when you do, you can bet they're God's 
people. You wonder why baptisms are down? It's because the Christian employee looks like the world. There's no difference. We have to change it. And we change it in our lives. So that it'll change in our church. So that it'll change in our community. And we can reach our community for Christ. If you would get your prayer.